So welcome, everyone. So open source is a no-brainer. Actually, that statement's false. Um, doing open source and doing it well and growing an ecosystem around it, it requires an incredible amount of brain power, in fact. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I won't lie, it's, it's difficult. And um, I've been doing it for, for quite a long time, and I can definitely tell you that it's not easy. Uh, you're responding to questions, you're, you're reviewing issues, reviewing code, organizing events, motivating people, showing up at conferences like this, preparing to speak, um, you know, getting to know people. So it's a daily duty, uh, and it takes investment both in the form of time and money. So you kind of think, well, why, why are we doing it? I thought it was supposed to be free or easy um, or, you know, save us money. Um, and the idea is that it produces value, and you have to see that. And so for anything that produces value, it's worth doing it. Okay, if you if you know that it's doing it's producing value, then then it's something that's worth doing. So I believe strongly that open source produces tremendous value. Um, it's really the best model that we have for producing open source software. I mean, for producing software in general, open source is the best model for it. Uh, but if you do it poorly, what you unleash onto the world is a code dump. We've seen that. We've seen projects where, yes, it's open source, but is it open source? Mm. Are they really? Um, using the, the, the idea of open source, uh, or are they just kind of trying to play the game without really practicing? And so, but if you do it well, your project or your community or whatever you're building uh, is going to grow, and most importantly, it's going to develop a life of its own. So you don't have to be there and be on all the time for it. So how do you do it? How do you get your project that spark, and how do you make it grow? So I've cultivated uh, several very successful open source communities. Um, on sparse budgets. Uh, this is the, 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 the um, uh, background for, for Arkillian. Arkillian is one of my, um, uh, my favorite projects, uh, and a story that I'm going to share with you today comes out of this community. And each of those experiences have taught me lessons. Um, and it's been a long journey, but an exciting one. And, and, and frankly, I've actually waited quite a long time to be able to tell these stories. So what I hope is that this advice can help make your community building efforts wildly successful, whether it's open source software or even something else, because this all, this applies across the board. And what I really want to hope, help you do is stand out from the crowd. So the number one thing, perhaps it goes without saying, is that if you want to grow, you've got to have something that's worth joining. So you have to think about that. How many projects have you come across that, that make you think to yourself, what is this project for? Um, I'm not even sure what it does. Don't be that project. So find your purpose before you go out into the world. Why, do you, why does your project exist and why are you pushing for it? Because if you don't know this in somewhere along the lines, uh, you're going to find yourself way out on a limb and not really sure why you're spending all this money, time and money doing it. So know your why. People, they need to know like where you're headed. So they need a vision that they can believe in. And I believe that that also means they need kind of a person or a group of people that they believe in, right? Because the vision is not uh, enough by itself. They, they have to be connecting with it personally. So, so you want to give them a sense of purpose and a rally call and a raison d'etre, uh, which is one of, my, one of my favorite beers, actually, um, long before I studied any French. Uh, People want to be able to achieve something that's bigger than, than themselves, um, both because it feels good and because the, what they can do by themselves is limited. And so when they join with other people, they can see, hey, I can accomplish things that I can't do by myself. So you really want to know to build on that. But at the same time, you have to remember that open source is created by people. No matter how big the community, it's individuals that are making it up. So to grow open source, you need to understand what motivates people. And the secret to that is to amp them up. So in his book, Drive, uh, which I highly recommend reading, Dan Pink identifies three key factors that drive people. And those three key factors, which happen to spell amp, is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So you'll see this throughout these themes throughout uh, this talk. Per so participation in open source is voluntary. right? There's been a lot of discussion back and forth about this. Hey, how does it work if people are doing it for free? Um, you do have to remember and respect the fact that they're not employees uh, of your company. But you also have to recognize that it's actually false to think that they're working for free, uh, because that's really a naive way of thinking about open source. They just aren't working for direct financial gain, uh, which is the traditional model. 
they're driven by something, something else, something we've kind of mentioned already, um, is, but they, they enjoy doing what they love, and they often want to do it away from things that they don't love. So they don't like their job, they come to open source, and they get enrichment they don't get in their job. So there's something that open source has that the other parts of their life maybe don't necessarily have. Uh, they may... Um, you know, they may spend a lot of time with their family and, and um, they love that time, but at the same time they don't get a chance to talk about really technical things. So they go into open source to, to fill that side of their brain up. And I think the other thing about it though is they, they are there to learn from other people. So they know that if they join a community, then just being around other people, they're going to learn something. Uh, and they're not going to learn something if they don't show up. So these are kind of the reasons that they end up showing up this personal fulfillment. But what's important is for you to know that because if you know that they're there for personal fulfillment, you can pay them in a sense by helping them achieve that thing, right? So that if I know that that's what you're there for, I can help you achieve that. And if I don't know that, if I think that you're just here for free or whatever and I don't know why, then I'm not helping you and it doesn't seem like I'm giving you anything back. So this is the exchange, it's always an exchange. So you need to create a call for adventure. So if you think about it, your users or your community, they're your heroes. They're all, as individuals, they're heroes. And what the mission that they're on is a story. And it's your story. It's the story of your particular group. And that story, it shapes the culture of the community. And the other thing that's important, though, is that it, it helps decide what to do, what not to do. So, so Dogfish Head, which is the, the brewing company for the beer that I showed earlier, they have this great tagline. The tagline is off-centered ales for off-centered people. Notice how the tagline, it communicates a purpose. We're going to create a certain type of beer. It's going to be off-centered beer. It's going to be weird beer. We're not going to create like what everyone else creates. Um, and then there's this identity of the people that are there. You're off-centered people. You, we know you. We get you. We know that you're not like all those other people. So they kind of feel like, oh, okay, I'm with people that really understand me and I feel that connection. So that's the stuff that gets people behind you. So you don't want to let people pass you by. You want to get noticed, and to get noticed, you, you need to have a purpose. But you also need to be able to communicate that purpose. One mistake that a lot of um, open source uh, software developers, engineers make, is they think that the brilliant software, if they wrote like the most brilliant piece of software, Docker, whatever, Android, it's like that's enough to get people to act. And that's absolutely not true. To build a community, you need to be able to communicate. And your idea will be judged initially on how well you do that, on how well you perform that communication. And engineers especially are very, very attuned to esoteric, incomprehensible bullshit. Okay, They know when they hear jargon. So if you want to be able to really talk to them, you have to know what that sounds like and not do it. So this is, a, this is the quote that I was just, I was, uh, I was just referring to. And it's, it's interesting that, that, that engineers perhaps are a little bit more sensitive to this, maybe because they're more, more intelligent, who knows. But one way or another, this is the playing field that you're on. So you go in your project and you want to create a message. So of course when you push a project to GitHub, the first thing it notices when you don't have a readme file is, is that it's absent and they say, hey, but look at what it says specifically. I actually chose pretty good words here. They say, help people interested in this repository understand. Not help people um, that want to install your software know what to type in the command line. They're not speaking at that level. They're speaking at the level of make them care about your project. So to bring them in, you need to give them that message and you need to show up and you need to interact with them. So every project starts out as a ghost town. And no activity, so if a project has some activity and then psh, it kind of flatlines for a while, GitHub says, yeah, the last commit was like three years ago. That's a dead project for people. That's what they think. People, people will say, mm, I don't know if I'm investing in anything because I don't see any people around. So notice the presence of people matters a lot. And what's interesting is that people tend to get kind of violent with things when they think they're dead. And it's, it's funny, but I've actually observed this. It's sort of, uh, if you watch television shows or, or, or other types of um, uh, interactions, um, or if you think about your own experiences. You know, someone's, let's say they're, you know, they're down here. We'll do, we'll do a dramatization, you know? And they're, and they're kind of, and so the first thing you do, right, is you give them a little shake. 
Hey, get up. And then when they don't move, yeah, you get a little bit more violent. Hey, get up, right? And then, you know, you dump them out of the chair. I've actually observed the exact same thing with projects. So the, the people will come in and they'll, they'll sort of just tap, hey, are you up? And, and the project doesn't respond, OK? This project is, um, I don't agree with the things in this project, they'll say. Oh, OK, they don't hear anything. OK, that's a stupid project. No one should get involved in that. So they kind of had the same reaction. So that's not good for growth. So the key is every project starts out as a ghost town because, well, you know, you're the first person you commit your code. No one's around. So what you need to do is you need to start generating activity. Okay? You, you want to communicate with the community. You want to be there, be on, try to be everywhere. You know, communicate openly to a fault. And here's an interesting thing. If you have, an, have a choice to talk about something, discuss something in a team, um, well, writing a blog post and stuff takes time. But if you're going to already be talking about something, just put it out in the open. Because then all of a sudden, you generate activity and you didn't do any extra work. So put the stuff out there just to show, hey, we're here. We're around. The other part of that is to take the time to meet the individual. So you really want to make every single person who comes forward feel like you have all the time in the world from them. And I love to tell this little story. I used to have this manager, and he was just the best manager I ever had. And I would, if I had a problem, I would go to him. And let's say we were in the middle of a production fire. And he would say, well, the fire can wait. What do you need? Come into my office, close the door, sit down, and he would just say, what's going on with you? It was like the world could stop. If I had a problem, the world could just stop because that was the most important thing at any given moment, that for some reason I wasn't, I wasn't happy or I wasn't being noticed. That's what you really want to do with your community, to make them feel like you have all the time in the world. You don't have all the time in the world, and they probably don't need all of your time. But at that very critical moment when they do need you and you show them, yes, I can give you my time, I can give you five minutes, then they're, you know what, they, they don't capitalize your time. They say, oh, your time's probably pretty valuable. Okay, thank you for doing that. I'll let you go. So in the end, it doesn't end up taking a lot of time, so it makes a lot of sense to do it. Communication is truly like the water that flows through your project your, and, and, and the water that your community needs to grow. Or another way to think of it is like it's the synopsis of OSS, right? All that activity is, is going to be showing life. But also remember that communication is two-way, right? You, so you need to listen to them. You, they hold the secret in open source. They hold the secret to what makes you great. So if you never listen to them, then it's all just whatever's in your head. So make sure that you... Um, you, you capitalize on this because the intelligence of a project truly is in the collective thinking, right? In the power in numbers. Uh, there's this great quote by Matt, Matt Ridley, and he says, what's relevant to a, he says society, I say community, is how well people are communicating their ideas and how well they're getting along, which we'll talk about later, not how clever any individuals are. And it's funny how a lot of open source projects, if you think about it, it's like, oh, that person, that, that one person is the luminary. They're the ones that are really brilliant. But mm, if, remember when I said earlier, people get together in a community because they know that together they can do more. So even if someone's really brilliant, the most they can ever do is what one person can do. So any community that wants to sort of outpace them just has to know how to leverage the collective. And then they instantly win. It doesn't matter how brilliant any one person is, because together, they'll think of the same things and perhaps a lot more. The other part of this is showing them that you want them there, showing them that you actually want to grow. A lot of people, they say, we want to grow. But then it's like they, don't, they kind of get annoyed when people come around. right? So do you want to grow, or do you not want to grow? I mean, get your story straight. So one way to do this is to make the communication personal, as I mentioned before. You know, like I'm here at the conference and I, and I spend some time, you know, with the community members and we talk about ideas. And that, that's very meaningful to me and them both. Um, but you really want to think of it as that when, when they come forward, that they've shared. So let's say someone files an issue or they come forward and they say, hey, um, I have this idea. I want to share it with you. They can never get that part of their life back again. So you have to really respect that and say, even if the, you know, even if the question was sort of silly or whatever, you want to realize that, that they gave something to you, and at least you can do is give them something back before you send them on their way. So one way I like to do this, communication doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of words. I really love 
the plus one. So the plus one is extremely effective, yet very terse. We're not in these long debates, and I'm respecting their time. It says, hey, I'm present, first of all. So, OK, if, just like I said before with the activity, if the project has no activity, it's like, is, is there anyone even here? So if I say plus one, obviously I'm alive on the other side. Pulse, right? I sent them a pulse. Uh, but the other way, you know, it says, hey, I support this. I'm empowering you. Keep going. I'm not going to add and tell you what to do. I'm basically going to say, keep thinking, keep going, keep broadening what you're doing. And it provides encouragement. So we'll talk a little bit about encouragement later. But um, the other way, of course, plus one is one way. Another way is if I just push commits to GitHub. Now, I see, now I, I've been talking a lot about being personal, but it's not all personal. That is very effective. Or if I tweet about the project, I, at least I'm pushing stuff out there and people are saying, oh, I'll pick up and I sense your presence and I feel like I'm with people. There are people around me. And so I want to be here. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to be around people. Now, the most important thing in open source is to be honest. So honest, transparent, and frank. Um, you really, really want to be real. And that, we could say, is being human. Now, a lot of companies, I realize, oh, companies aren't human, so they have this problem. But there are ways companies can, be, can do that by having things like developer advocates or community leaders. Um, because otherwise, they're going to know. If you give them crap, if you give them bullshit, they're going to know that whatever, and you're dead to them. Once they determine that you're not honest with them, then they, there's like a million other projects they could be doing. There's another, other initiatives even outside of software they could be doing. So yeah. And if you're like an open source, uh, if you're a company and you have like a product, keep your product out of open source development. Seriously, no one in the open source community really cares about your product. They don't mind that you have a product. As long as you do your product for product things, and you do when you're at open source, you're doing stuff for the community, for the good of the community. And you always want to be thinking about the good of the community, not self-centered on your, on your needs. Um, otherwise, what happens is your contributions are like not in good faith. And that's kind of like not filling the contract of open source. So by all means, make your product and sell it for tons of money that's based on open source. But when you do the open source work with people, do the open source work. Um, and the other thing to be careful of is don't let yourself get lost in the inside. I saw this a lot at Red Hat. You know, people will be working on open source, and then they're like, we have really important things to discuss, so we'll just disappear from the community for two or three weeks. OK? When you stop communicating with the community and you're like doing open source, um, you're not doing any work. Even if you're doing a ton of work inside the company, you're doing no work. So. Uh, yeah, and especially, and I've seen, I've seen companies do this, and this kills me the most, never, ever decide the fate of an open source project internally. Uh, like, we don't want to participate in that project anymore, and we think that project should be ended. Okay, it's not your right to decide when a project that you gave to the community, that you developed to the community. You can't decide when the end of the project is. Only they can decide. So if you want to grow, you gotta, you got to show up. And you got to connect with them. And so um, I'm wearing this t-shirt today, so I'll show you the back. So this is the Tommy Tribe t-shirt. I don't work for Tommy Tribe, but I feel like I'm part of their community. Um, Tommy Tribe is a brilliant company at doing this. Uh, they get together at conferences, and instead of them having a, a Tommy Tribe dinner, they find they found this increasingly large group of what they call the usual suspects, which is like, people that support their company. And it looks, when you go to a conference, like there's like four people around the WebSphere booth, and there's like 500 people following the Tommy Tribe people around. That matters to being able to have a product. That matters that in the marketplace, because people show this devotion to you. So we'll talk a bit about devo devotion later, but it's pretty amazing. So when people come in, make them feel welcome. Be all-inclusive. Um, you really, really want to create a safe place that says, hey, anyone is interested. Any ideas are, are welcome here. Please come, contribute, and share. The first touch, so when the first time you ever see a username on the mailing list, and the issue tracker, whatever, you have to realize something. That is them testing you. And oftentimes, they are testing you, and they are baiting you a little bit. Um, they want to see how you respond. If you respond like crappy, then they're like, okay, screw this community, I'm out of here. 
so one of the ways that they do it, they show up, is that they ask questions. So questions are often how people um, get, uh, come into a project. They come in with a question they have. So first of all, that question may actually be designed to test you, and they may already know part of the answer. So don't look at them like, wow, how can you be so stupid? You don't know the answer to that question. That's exactly what they're hoping is going to happen if you're a person who's not welcoming, that they get that information right up front, fail fast, get out of the community. So great questions. And to be honest, I mean, I, I love when new people ask questions because the dumb questions, those are the best questions, right? Because those are the questions that you don't want to ask yourself. They'll ask it for you, though. So maybe that question just needs to be asked. The other thing to think about is that every single person who has ever led a project after the original creator had some first touch to the project. They had a question that they came in with. So I've been doing Ask a Doctor project for about three years. My first contribution to ASCII Doctor was a typo. It was a word that was spelled wrong in the readme, and I fixed it. Okay? So every single person who's going to lead the project, you're not going to be able to judge how much of an influence they'll have on the project in the long term based on that first touch. Um, I don't really have time to, to tell the story right now, but basically I had contributed. I'm pretty well known in the open source community, so it would be, it's not like someone wouldn't have recognized my, my handle or whatever. I contributed to another project that's upstream from, from ASCII Doctor. And I was told when I submitted the patch that I was being very rude uh, because I was very specific about what the patch did. And I was thinking to myself, it was like, I can't imagine ever telling someone who sent a pull request that they were rude. It's just the most bizarre. Obviously, they don't really want to grow. So I would never do that, and I, I recommend that you never do that. You know, how many times have you come into a project and said, you know, can you actually, you came in the wrong way? Can you go and use, like, the other door when you come in? It's just a shitty thing to do to, to, to people that you want to help, that you want to help you. Um, and people rarely come through the, the main entrance. This is the home page of your project right here for most people. Because they they're tried it and it didn't work. And they go, mm, okay, how am I going to tell them that I don't know what I'm doing? Well, I tried to read... Maybe they read the documentation, maybe they didn't. But they come in and they say, and I, I really wanted to fill something out here, but like, why doesn't your project do X, Y, Z? And you, you know what you do? This is, this is what you respond to this. Um, hey, welcome. Thanks for coming to the project. I didn't even look at the question yet, right? Because I said, I'm looking straight at you. And the reason is, is because that question meant that they used it. Like, they're, they're, they're already here. So if they got to the point they're asking a question, this is brilliant. Like, this may be a person that could one day be a contributor. So you always want to be welcoming. You want to be welcoming, and you want to be welcoming new people all the time, right? Because growth is when the number of people coming in is more than the number of people coming out. Pretty simple math here, right? And people are always leaving because people have other things they need to do. So that first touch, it needs to be happening, like, all the time. And if it's not happening, yeah, you're probably not growing. But keep in mind, too, that formation and growth, it's super passion and ordeal. So people are going to come in what I call they come in hot, right? They come in with all this passion, and they have an idea, and, or they were kind of, they spent a lot of time, and they want to tell you about the fact that, they took, that it took them much longer than they wanted to take. So they're really probably more frustrated than they are mad at you. And so if you read it as mad, right, you have to assume the best in people. So you want to give them outlets. You channel that passion. OK, here's a person who's super passionate. They obviously took the time to write all this explanation. Respond just to the key parts that will help them move to the next step or get involved. Because your responsibility is to make them productive. It's not their responsibility. So you have to think, OK, what can I do with this person to kind of get them into this? And if they leave, then you failed them. Sometimes they're not the right person. But, but, but if they were the right person, they left. You, you failed them. So, and you're going to also have dissenters. So dissenters are very passionate as well, people that don't agree with you. Don't alienate and chastise them. First of all, it ma makes you look really stupid to, to, to other people because, you know, people don't like when people are arguing with each other, you know, in a way that's sort of mean. Um, instead, what you want to do is assimilate them. So they say, your product is crappy because it doesn't have this feature. And then you say, what, how do you think you'd implement that feature in our project? Like, do you have an idea about how we could use, do that? How do we get there? And they say, oh, I'm glad you asked. So there were, in Archelian, we did this all the time. Uh, there were people that were extremely critical in their blogs. And we realized that they 
were being very critical, sure, but they also were very, very specific about what was wrong. And so we, we, we asked them specifically, like, if they could give us more information about that idea. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh my God, you, you asked, and they became really nice, like the next day. It was crazy. It was like they just did an about face, turned around. So you remember that you never lose points for being professional, right? No one ever says, boy, that guy's such a nice guy. What a nice guy. What a nice girl. So can't believe they were so nice to me. Right? They, you never lose points for that. So treat everyone with respect. And I really like, I'm, I have to say, a comment on the, on the, the local space. I'm really impressed um, in Morocco, like how nice people are uh, to speakers for instance like so we I was in one of the talks yesterday and every single time a question came up it was like hey thank you for giving this talk and coming here and it was a very good talk I appreciate it wow normally people just boom but barrel into the question um, that's really do that that's solid that's that's definitely the way to grow community what's that plus one. yes plus one I like that um, so employees especially should be civil um, I worked at at Red Hat for a number of years, and there were a couple of, of really abrasive people. And uh, people used to always say, Does, doesn't your employer, like, think that you shouldn't act this way? And, um, you know, it's kind of tricky, but, like, uh, I think that if I was running a, a company and I had a person who was just treating people badly, I'd get rid of that person even if they were really smart because it's just completely unnecessary. Um, your, your professional environment, you should... Be nice to people. Um, you, because if it's because if it's a hostile, yeah, they're out of there. They're out of there. So there's um, there's this bumper sticker that showed up a couple of years ago. I used to live in Howard County in Maryland, and there was this bumper sticker that showed up. It used to say "Choose civility" in Howard County. I changed it here, and I thought to myself, okay, this is the, this is the citizens trying to tell each other to be good to each other, and I thought. What a lame bumper sticker, the, because it, it kind of seems so low, ex, such low expectations, like just be civil to each other, but don't be, you know, don't be good to each other, just do the bare minimum. That's what it felt like when I first read it. Anyway, I looked it up, you can go there, like choosecivility.org. There's like a whole doctrine about like how to be civil, and I realized that like this doctrine actually lines up exactly with what I'm talking about. It's be inclusive, acknowledge others, give praise, respect their opinions, give constructive criticism, and assume the best in people. I was like, yeah, exactly. So, and they were building a community. This was a living community. Uh, but, you know, so community's universal. And that tone that you set, you know, for the community, how you are to each other, that, that like shapes the whole community um, environment that you show up to every day. So if you want to show up to like a hostile environment, which no one wants to do, right? So you get to be in your own really nice community. So by by being nice, you get to go to a place that's nice. Now, once, they, once you receive a contribution, acknowledge it. Being thanked, it feels good every time. People don't feel up on gratitude. No one says, yeah, I had a lot of gratitude last night, I had a lot of thanks, um, I'm good, I don't need thanks. It's like every single time they, they really feel it because, because it's a lot more than, than, just, um, than just giving them credit. There's a lot there and it's just um, it's deeply, uh, deeply emotional for humans. But it's not necessarily something that can be automated. You want to be, gen uh, you know, you want to be uh, generous with it, but you also want to be sincere. Uh, we were just talking in the cab right over in this morning about these, these thank you tweets. And it's sort of like, is that, does that, is that count? Like, is that thanking people? Mm. When you group a bunch of people together and you just say thank you for a random thing, then they're kind of like, OK, I think I did something that they liked. I don't know what it was. Cool. Uh, so you want to be very specific. You want to say thank you for submitting that issue. That helps our project. Okay, so now they go, oh, they like when I do that specific thing, I'll do that again. So you do want to make sure you do that. But you should be doing it so much, you might as well be putting a key on your keyboard, right? You're just thanking them, thanking them. The one thing that I, I like to say is you know you're doing it well enough when you know the names of everyone, because you got to use the names, you know, um, you know thank you, um, uh, you know, Jessica or, or Jan or whatever, thank you for doing these things. I know their handle on Twitter, I know their handle on GitHub, I got to use it all the time. That's, that's a sign that I'm doing enough. When I start to forget the usernames, I go, I must have not been using them very much. Maybe I need to thank them a bit more. So, but what's important about the thanks, the plus one, those types of things, is it says to the contributors, I see you. And I appreciate your work, and that it matters that you're here. 
And what's funny is there's no secrets here. It's not like if I were to, I was sitting down with my community and said, I'm going to thank you all when you do things that I'm, that are good, that, that help the project. And they go, oh, well, now that you told me that, you know, that doesn't, it's not going to have any effect on me. It does. It still does, even when they know about it. Because, um, because it's not just about, like, you're not giving them something. It's like, oh, here's this little bunny for doing that. It's not that. It, it, it basically means that we have a relationship. And so the, the relationships, you think about it, like when you're, let's say you're dating someone or whatever in your life, and you haven't talked to them for a while, you kind of need to replenish that relationship because you kind of think, well, maybe we're kind of growing apart. This is the same thing. Thank you sort of grows, it lets you grow back together. It says, hey, yeah, I, I remember who you are. I remember what you did recently. So these are all the same forces at work here. And it keeps them motivated. It's, an, it's a great way. So I love thanks because it's a way of telling them to keep going without telling them to keep going, right? Because if I said, hey, thanks for, um, um, thanks for getting that release out or thanks for fixing that issue, they, then they might think, oh, well, there's some other issues I need to fix, so um, maybe I should keep doing it. So if I came and said, can you, keep, can you do those issues you aren't doing? Yeah. They're like, no. Right? So it's just not the right way of doing. And you've got to play these sort of games. So I want to I wanna, um, I wanna share this story with you real quick. Um, it's a very uh, a personal story, but a very specific one. I had been working with open source communities a long time, and I was in the process at the time um, of building the community for Archelian. But I couldn't put my finger on what was making what we were doing, what was making what we were doing work, and what was making communities not work. Uh, and until DevOx uh, Belgium in 2013. So two years earlier, Ajlek Knudsen, who was also a speaker here, he spoke yesterday on, on Archelian, uh, we were walking down the street, down to Kaiserle, with a newcomer to the Archelian community, Bartosz Maczek. And we had arrived in a restaurant where we were going to eat dinner. And we said to him, hey, join us. Um, come in. And he said, no, 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 I, I have to go. I, I'm not a speaker like you guys, and, and I probably shouldn't join you. And he just walked off. And, and I was like, and I sort of looked at each other like, OK, what's going on? And instinctually, we said, OK, this is definitely not going to fly. I was like, go get him. Go pull him back here. Because Bartaj, he was just as much of our Killian community member as the project leads, even that time. So fast forward to two years later, again at DevOps, and he had become a speaker, a, you know, a DevOpsian. He was, he was speaking, in fact, about getting involved in open source. So that year, we, we were actually all rooming together. We get, did like um, an Airbnb thing, and we, we left the apartment uh, that morning at different times, which why is another story for another time. Uh, but anyway, he, I, I was attending another talk before his in another one of the theaters, and so I got held up afterwards talking to someone in the corridor, and so I was a bit late, and I... I turned the corner to, to go into Bartage's talk. And as I entered the room, the room monitor looked at me going, mm-mm. And I practically had to step over people just to get to where I am in this picture. And here's Bartage all the way down there on stage. The theater is packed all the way up here, 500 plus people in this theater. Two years earlier, you know, Bartage, he said, I'm just another person. I'm not worthy of note. Um, and now, me as part of the Archelian leadership, I can't even get in the room to see him speak. You know, we, so we, in a way, we believed in him. And we knew that he would be able to achieve this. We believed in him before he was ready to believe in himself. And now he's a friggin' celebrity, Batman, okay? Now, this is not even the best part of the story. This is just the warm-up because uh, about halfway through the talk, he put the names and faces up of other open source contributors uh, on the screen. He said, these are the people that inspire me in open source. But those people weren't the project leads. You know, Again, no Ajlak and me, where it's not us. They were other community members that he had started working with him. So that was one thing. Then he went even a step further. And he only had a quickie time slot. So it's 15 minutes. We're talking a really short talk. He turned the stage over to a developer he had met at the Hacker Garden earlier that, uh, that week. And he said, I want to share with you someone who I just met who inspires me is doing amazing work on this project. And he gave up the stage, and the guy got up there and talked about the project he was working on. Bartaj had chosen, instead of taking all the limelight for himself, he had chosen to shine the light on the work of other people. I was totally choked up at that moment. And I realized at that moment what makes community work. You as a project leader direct the limelight on the people that should be recognized but aren't yet being recognized. 
And you're making opportunities for others. Remember at the very beginning I said they're not, they're not working for free. So what can I give them if they're, you know, if, but if there's, they're not my employee, what can I give them? I can give them opportunity. That's how I to can make pay them something of themselves. Them. And Bartaj, what's amazing, is he had responded to that call because he turned around after we had kind of invited him in to the, to, to the project and not treated him as an outsider. He turned around and did the same thing to other people. So this is the amazing thing about community. Now, the story goes on. Because in 2012, Bartosz received a JBoss Community Award for his work on Arkelion. Then last year, he became the community manager for Arkelion. Alex Soto, who's in the center here, was one of the people on his slide. Alex Soto is now the lead of the Arkelion Q project. He created the Ask Your Doctor J project. He's co-author of Arkelion in Action, and he's a DevOxian. He spoke this year at DevOx Belgium six times. Matter of fact, he did a talk for another person as well. So what's good for the community members ends up being fantastic for the project, and what's great for the project is great for the community members. Passing these opportunities on, and it, it builds the project's future, but it also builds a devoted community. What's amazing about these three guys, what I call three generations of Arkillian, is that they're like the best friends in the whole world. I mean, they're not just working together. They care deeply about each other. And they continue to do that with other people. So no, you can't be everywhere all the time with a community as it grows to 100, 1,000 people. But what you do is you're there by proxy. You're there because now sometimes, you know, when they call us up and they say, they want Alex to speak at DevOx or whatever. Not Oshlak, they want Alex to speak. Because Alex is sort of the superstar now. And that's, that's amazing for us. That's what we're trying to do. So recognition is something that can be passed on. Each leader has recognition to share because the leader is going to get attention just because their name is on the project. So they can choose to just kind of soak it all in or they can choose to pass that on. So you want to reflect the light on, on the people that deserve it. Thomas Jefferson had this great quote. He said, he who receives an idea from me they receive information, but I don't lose any. It's kind of like if you light someone else's candle, your candle doesn't get any less bright because their candle's now lit. So we realize that when we have that opportunity to pass something on, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing it. And once that community, like Bartosz, gets committed to growing the community, that's when the community gets a life of its own. It starts growing even without you. We grew the Archelian community to a very large community. We never received a budget for Archelian. Archelian's never gotten any money to grow. And it's one of the most, uh, in Java space, it's one of the most successful open source projects. And we never bought a t-shirt or, I mean, yeah, in the early days we kind of did some t-shirts, but like, it, we didn't have a booth. We didn't have anything. We just cared about the individuals and they passed on that message throughout uh, the, the community. So that's the key to growing open source, the key to growing a community that's not just large, but devoted. And if you don't do these things, you really are voting yourself out of the chance to grow. The other thing that you need to think about is, and I'll get a little bit more in the technical side of things, is like you have to think, is my open source project a real open source project? I mentioned that in the beginning. Or are you just a wallflower project? So kind of a wallflower, someone who's stuck to the wall and doesn't go away from it because they're scared. So if you want to grow, you have to distribute the load. And that means letting go of control. Now I know that sounds scary, but if you don't let go of control, if this girl doesn't let go of the edge, then the only place you can go in the pool is where the edge goes. Your open source project has the same problem or your, your, um, any sort of community you're building. If you don't give up leadership, Bartage, Alex, they've taken on leadership, been leads of modules and if you don't do that, then it's always just you and, and everything that you can accomplish all by yourself or your company can accomplish by itself. But there are ways to make it less scary. Automate liberally. I don't do it enough. You don't do it enough. Everything should be automated to the point where you, when you give up control, you're really not totally losing control because you know that the computer's there validating everything for you. So you want to leverage computation. With the automation in place, that's when you can start to turn over, uh, um, you can empower people, you can turn over the leadership and ownership. So, because empowerment, that's the key to getting people to stay working in open source. You know, they come and they do some stuff and they never get empowered, they kind of back away. But once you promote them to leaders, 
then they, they, they own part of the project and people look up to them. And trust creates that leadership. So we like to do, like we've done in all the communities we've done, we make, we figure out sections of the project that can be, that can be, that are like cohesive and we have someone lead it and they become the leader. Like I can't, I don't push code into a repository directly. I do a pull request because I don't, I'm not the leader. I have to ask the leader, hey, do you think that this should be merged? So you want to empower them. Every athlete that you've, you can ever think of has, has had a coach. And like what I was saying with Bartosz earlier, coaches help us believe in ourselves before we're ready to believe in ourselves. So they're a mentor. And as a community leader, you're a mentor because you're going to make them great. You know that you believe that they're going to be great before they see it. So you want to help them become productive members of the community and, and, and eventually leadership of the community or leadership of, of certain parts of the community. And it also helps you get away from the, the bus factor, you know, like, okay, if you're not working on the project because you're super busy, the project just sort of stagnates. When you have a, a big community that has lots of, that you passed on the leadership, if you're not there, the, the, the project's still doing stuff. And it goes back to that activity thing. If you're not showing activity, okay, then you get so tired. Like, i got to take a vacation every now and again. Of course you do. But while you're on vacation, those people you empowered are contributing to the project. And your project's constantly going. And no other way is really sustainable. Your project has to get out from, from sort of behind the display case, push away from the wall, and learn how to swim. You've got to learn how to swim by, by empowering the community. So finally, I want to talk just a bit about success. So um, success is the business you're in. There's this really great, um, so we just recently celebrated Back to the Future Day. There's this great photograph that we also think of the car when we think of Back to the Future, but this was actually really interesting. When he went Back to the Future, as he made mistakes, the future version of himself and his friends started to fade away. As he got things right, they sort of came back into view. As you have success, it's very easy for you to start making mistakes and that community that you grew, that's in that photograph, slowly start to fade away one by one. And so when we talk about growth, we're not talking about something that you grow up to and then you achieved it and you're done, but we're talking about something that you grow and it stays and, and hopefully keeps growing. So once you're starting to get success, you have to realize that you don't let, let up, you go in more. Because to a large degree, a successful community becomes your brand and your voice. One of the things that we do in all of our projects is everyone who's ever contributed to the project, we run a script and we put their faces up on a web page. And this is, first of all, this is so easy to do that no one, no open source project should not be doing this. This is absolutely absurd if they don't do this. And, but what's so important about this is it gets back to realizing that the community is individuals that are all working together. It's not, oh, we're this big community and we're this amorphous blob. No, we are individuals and the people's faces and names that I know and other people know. And they come and they say, thank you, Anders. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Rob, for doing that. And they get praise. Remember the reflecting the light? This is us reflecting the light back onto the community members. So I like to call this sharing the prosperity, is that as you become, um, as you grow, then that growth should be something that you as a collective community pass on. But I think that it's really a part of being a good citizen of open source. Uh, they helped you create the software. So if, you, if they help you create the software and then you didn't thank them and you just sold your product and you were like, sweet, we made lots of money, um, that's kind of crappy because they were really the ones that helped you get there. So this way, and you always think of new ways, is, is showing them recognition, but it's also about always including them and giving them a seat at the table. So a great example is, you know, we're at, at projects like, I mean, at conferences like this, oftentimes a company will say, hey, we're going to do a company dinner. So it's for the company, it's for the employees. And uh, um, like the Arkillian project people, we never went to those. And it wasn't because we didn't like our colleagues or, or, or we didn't think, you know, that we were part of the company. It was just inappropriate. 
It was inappropriate that we would exclude people that weren't with the company when everyone that is the community and who is present in the conference, uh, the, the community members that are present in the conference, they're part of it too. So just because they're not working for you, that, there's no other way, there's no better way to create an us versus them scenario to say, actually, you're not really with us. You're sort of, yeah, you're not, we're going to do a company dinner. This is a thing. Break those barriers. Break them down. Don't let that happen. So we came up with this, this um, diagram that I think if I had to diagram what we do, this is probably the closest thing that I can come up with. Um, we start out by inspiring them. We talked about the read me. Uh, the mission, the ra raison d'etre. When, when they show up and they have a question or they do some contribution, recognize them, welcome them, say hello. But that's not enough to grow a community. That's why it's still we're in the flat line here. Okay? To grow a community, you start to encourage the people that are there to do stuff, uh, to be a little bit more involved. One great example is, hey, why don't you submit to speak at that conference about Archelian or ASCII doctor, encourage your community members to go speak. And when they do speak, tweet it and be like, hey, everyone who's in the Lyon area, uh, my community member, you know, so-and-so is speaking, go see them. So that's a way to, to, um, to get support for them. Um, and then empower them. That's the final step, is that you give them the leadership. Bartaj is the community manager and lead of certain modules. Uh, um, Alex Soto is the lead of the Archelian Q project, lead of ASCII Dr. J. You know, we go on and on. Those are the people that came up, and eventually they became leads. But the most beautiful part, so that's nice, and that's where most people are. They're kind of between the encourage and empower thing. But this arrow is, this is what we do differently than what everyone else does, is that we get the community members to actually pass on the culture and start inspiring the next generation, and it goes around and around. And that's what I call, basically, the community is reinvesting in itself at this point. So you want contributors to be successful because they chose to join your project, and you want other people to see that. Other people who are your competitors, and, but more importantly, other people who are not in the project that see, hey, if I go contribute to that project, everyone who's contributed to that project so far is successful. So uh, that's where I want to be. I want to go in, in that project. And of course, it has to interest them as well. But uh, that gets them involved. So you make them successful. So the key to growing open source and gaining a devoted community is to care about the individual's success. The, the, the open source, uh, the success of the community is because the individuals are all succeeding. And then, the, collectively, it forms the success and growth of your community. So thank you, and good luck, namaste.